what was what was your first thought when it started breaking out was it a surprise i doubt it was but how, well, were you surprised that he invaded actually? i was surprised that you had an invasion of that scale um i had expected that putin would um use a manufactured crisis in the Donbass to send in uh, what he would call Russian peacekeeping troops, who would then expand the territories held by the Donbass rebels and uh, would then demand that uh, the Ukrainian government should um, promise never to join NATO and to be neutral and to accept autonomy. So, that I, so I expected some sort of invasion. The idea of a full-scale invasion in which he was going to try to do a smash and grab, depose the Ukrainian government and replace it and then control the whole territory, uh, that did surprise me. I, I thought he could accomplish most of what he wanted at a much lower cost by the strategy I mentioned. And so what, what do you attribute to the miscalculation? I, and uh, I should say most other uh, colleagues in the uh, foreign policy establishment, um, underestimated Putin's romanticism. In other words, it, he actually believed the statements he made about Ruski Mir and Ukraine not being a country and that uh, if he came in with troops, he, he'd be welcomed with flowers and so forth. Um, I had always thought of uh, Putin as a cynical, calculating um, uh, Machiavellian. Turns out he was a romantic Machiavellian, and that has led him into uh, a, a grave mistake and grave problems. So I have to, I think the first thing you do when you make a a mistaken uh, guess is you say, why did I go wrong? I was wrong. And that's whatever I think I was wrong. I, I think the, the people who got this right, uh, like Fiona Hill or Angela Stent, who've written books about Putin and have observed him uh, very closely over years, uh, both of them had previously been on the National Intelligence Council and they were right. And they, uh, I think they were going on the, on a deeper understanding of Putin. If you add to this, to the failure to realize by many of us, how much uh, Putin actually believed uh, in this uh, mystical view of the Russian people originating around Kiev and so forth. Um, and you combine that with his increased autocratic uh, position, and you combine that with COVID, which leads him to have this uh, rid ridiculous long table. Um, and you then say, what kind of information is going to flow up? And are intelligence people in Russia willing to tell the emperor uh, he has no clothes? Uh, you realize that the combination of those two things uh, could lead to the miscalculation. How does the West contribute to this conflict? Is this, you know, we had talked about NATO expansion. A lot of people now are saying that maybe wasn't entirely the reason. What could have we have done? Or what do you think, or do you have regrets on our side? The Bucharest statement in 2008 that NATO, uh, that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. And our constant repetition of it, even though everybody knew it wasn't going to happen, because no, NATO works on consensus and you were never going to get uh, the, all the European members to agree to this. I think that was a serious mistake. And so it, had, it was a contributory factor uh, in terms of uh, exacerbating uh, Russian reactions. And, uh, but I think the people like John Mearsheimer and others who said it was our NATO decision which caused this crisis are neglecting the fact that these views of Putin's about uh, Russia, that Ukraine is not a real country and it belongs with Russia uh, that goes back before NATO expansion 
and certainly before the Bucharest Statement of 2008. So was it a contributory factor? Yes. Did we, uh, did we, meaning NATO, play our hands poorly by pretending that it was real when it wasn't? Uh, that was a mistake. Uh, but was this the major cause of what we are seeing today? I think the answer to that is no. What I find fascinating, uh, especially from the soft power point of view, the Ukrainians seem to be winning that battle in terms of, and, and, and out of nowhere, I know that a lot of Americans probably never really thought about Ukraine, but now everyone has the Ukrainian flag. So how can you walk us through how Zelensky and the Ukrainians were able to capture the hearts and minds of the world so quickly? Zelensky has proven to be an extraordinarily adept leader in terms of information. And I think the fact that he was a, uh, an actor uh, indeed, a comedian uh, probably helped on that. Uh, sometimes actors make extraordinarily good leaders. Witness Ronald Reagan, uh, whose skill as an actor helped him to uh, present things to the American people in the world. I think Zelensky has, uh, if you'd had a different uh, Ukrainian leader, it might have been more difficult. But I think it's also true that... Uh, uh, after Crimea, the Russian in invasion of Crimea in 2014, uh, many Ukrainians who had been, uh, you know, sympathetic to Russia or at least ambivalent about Russia, basically turned uh, more nationalistic. And uh, now uh, Putin has solidified that. I mean, those amb uh, Ukrainians who were ambivalent in terms of their views of Russia have now been become confirmed nationalists as a result of Putin's action. So in that sense, um, uh, Putin destroyed whatever soft power, the ability to attract that Russia still had in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians by their general uh, her heroism and Zelensky by his adept leadership have won the battle for uh, soft power. And uh, you see this when Germany cancels Nord Stream 2 pipeline, when uh, you have uh, the willingness to kick uh, uh, Russia out of SWIFT, um, things which would have been unthinkable uh, or, or, or very difficult to accomplish a few years ago suddenly became uh, practical policies. And that was from a large part the the Russian use of hard power destroyed their soft power, and that turned out to cost them. Where do you see the contours of, I heard there's a ceasefire, although I've also heard that Putin will just be, regroup and continue his press forward once he figures out how to do what he wants to do. What are we going to do as a world community now? Well, there are a range of scenarios of what could happen next. On the rosy scenario end, um, you would argue that the Chinese realize that this is uh, an opportunity for them to recover the soft power that they've lost by their close association with Putin, and that by pressing Putin, uh, by offering to mediate him, pressing Putin behind the scenes to take them seriously and to make some compromises, uh, you get a, uh, uh, an agreement of sorts. It won't be a pretty, pretty agreement um, in regards to Ukraine or Donbass and so forth, but it may stop the slaughter of uh, innocent people in Ukraine. And so in that sense, if you, uh, if you can look, think of a rosy scenario, it would be the Chinese, but I, I, perhaps the Turks or somebody else, I, who press hard to get a, um, uh, a, a some sort of a more than a ceasefire, it, it essentially a um, a negotiation about what will lead to the withdrawal of, of Russian troops. Now um, that implies that Putin is willing to take an off ramp. Um, if you go back to what we said about Putin's psychology, you can go back to the assessments of people like Fiona Hill or Angela Stent and others, 
uh, Putin may not be willing to take it off ramp. Uh, his initial plan of a smash and grab has failed, but plan B seems to be what you might call the Chechnya option of reducing a uh, number of Ukrainian cities to the rubble of something like Grozny and hoping to essentially beat the Ukrainians into submission. Uh, if so, that may take, um, that may go on for several months. In other words, it's, it, this isn't, uh, uh, this, this, this is the opposite scenario, the gloomy scenario, which is you're going to see a lot of uh, destruction of Ukrainian cities and a lot of killing of innocent Ukrainian women and children uh, for months until at some point, uh, you assume the, the war would end. One way of it ending would be um, Putin finally captures Kyiv and destroys Zelensky and puts in a puppet. I don't, I think that would uh, uh, really be a, a spurious ending because I don't think, I think you, what you'll have is then a resistance in Ukraine that can go on even longer. Uh, the other ending would be something more along the lines of uh, what I described, of a bargain in which, let's say, the um, Ukrainians promise uh, not to join NATO and to become neutral, uh, but uh, and they agree to disagree on the status of uh, of, U of Crimea, uh, and they accept some sort of autonomy uh, for the Donbas, uh, Luhansk, and Donetsk. Um, so those are different scenarios from. Uh, what I might call the more optimistic to the more pessimistic. However, there's still a more pessimistic scenario, uh, uh, which is that um, uh, if this, if this, if Putin's plan B doesn't work, that he then uh, decides to turn to uh, demonstration use or a tactical use of nuclear weapons to uh, try to change the terms of the bargaining and to uh, reduce the willingness of, of NATO countries to uh, supply uh, arms to the Ukrainians. And some people have mentioned a, you know, a demonstration shot over the uh, Black Sea. Others have mentioned the use of, of a tactical nuclear weapon against Ukrainian troops in the eastern part of the country, something of that sort. Uh, that strikes me as, a, as an even gloomier scenario. I don't rate that as high as the other scenarios that I've described so far, but um, I can't rate it or make it go away. In other words, it, it may be one chance in a hundred or one chance in a thousand, but it's not zero. We've given the Ukrainians weapons, we've given them you know, the sanctions have happened, which are unprecedented. Do you imagine the West standing by while the women and children are being killed over many months? And if you ask, do I think that you'll have direct conflict between Russian and um, NATO troops? I think not. Um, I think the, the, the risks of, uh, of a direct uh, nuclear confrontation are too high. And uh, that, uh, I mean, what we've seen is that uh, the U.S. has put American troops in the Baltic uh, uh, countries and into uh, Poland, and that essentially provides a tripwire, which Putin sees that if he crosses those lines, he will wind up killing Americans uh, in countries where there's an Article 5 guarantee under NATO. So presumably that reinforcement of deterrence there, uh, uh, I think would work, but uh, you can't be 100% sure. I mean, if, if, uh, if Putin really is bogged down and uh, the arms uh, coming in through Poland are preventing him from accomplishing his military objectives, it's plausible that he might try to bomb uh, supply routes um, in Poland or Romania. I, I kind of doubt that because of the reasons I just gave. 
So that goes back to your original question. Is I don't expect um, uh, direct fighting between uh, American, NATO, and uh, uh, Russian troops because of the concern about the about the nuclear potential for nuclear escalation. Um, but it also means that there's a limit on what we can do to stop the slaughter. Uh, you can take even stronger positions on sanctions. Um, uh, you can increase the quality of some of the weaponry uh, that's being sent into uh, uh, Ukraine and so forth. But I'm, I'm, I find it very depressing to watch what's happening to the Ukrainian people. And I wish I could give you a, a happy scenario saying, well, we won't have to watch it for long, but alas, we may. I have wrote a book some years ago called Nuclear Ethics um, about nuclear deterrence. And I said, as horrible as nuclear weapons are, they have the effect of what I call being a crystal ball. And that if you'd taken the leaders of uh, Europe in uh, August of 1914, and you'd show them in a crystal ball what the end of World War I would look like, which is their empire, four empires uh, dissolved and they all lose their thrones, I doubt that they would have taken the risks they took in August 1914. Um, in that sense, nuclear weapons uh, are like a crystal ball. The leader who says, I'll press just a little harder here, uh, has to say, wait a minute, uh, suppose that I make a mistake. You know, crystal balls can be dropped or shattered. Um, and so I think the, the prospects of a major nuclear war are, are very low, but humans make mistakes accidents happen. So I can't rule it out completely, but I, I wouldn't put a high probability on it. All the people that have tried to help create a balanced world, a stable world, analyze what it takes to create a world system that works. How are you feeling about what's happening? Not happy, uh, to, to, to put it in the simplest terms, but I think you have to look at the parts of the glass that are still a quarter full. Um, and um, if you, what's interesting is that uh, the, when the UN uh, was created, uh, the principle is that you didn't create or didn't start a war without permission of the Security Council uh, or in self defense. Um, and uh, this provided a framework which has been abused at times. Russia abused it in 2014. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the principle that you don't use force to steal your neighbor's territory uh, has held pretty well. Now you say, oh, so what? Well, in the 19th century and the 18th century, there was no such principle. And so when the UN um, uh, General Assembly voted overwhelmingly um, to reaffirm the principle of sovereignty, um, that, that was of some interest. Uh, there were countries which um, uh, were not willing to take the position on sanctions, but nonetheless wanted to reaffirm this, this position that uh, uh, you don't use uh, force to steal your neighbor's territory. And I think that's a, a, a healthy um, um, uh, sign. There's also the fact that um, if you look at, at why is China uh, not supplying arms to Russia and uh, why is it um, uh, being more cautious even when Putin and Xi have this very tight personal relationship, uh, China doesn't want to break the economic interdependence with not only um, the US, but with Europe. And uh, so secondary sanctions uh, are, are something which reinforces these principles. Um, so, you know, the glass still is at least a quarter 
full. And uh, I think we should try to then see how much we can fill it up again when this eventually comes to an end. In addition, even if you put them together, Russia and China are about, or they're less than 20% of the world economy, whereas the US and its allies, NATO and Japan, are 50% of the world economy. So in that sense, uh, I think it, 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 what we're seeing is that the period after the Ukraine crisis um, is not one where the West is going to be, uh, I think, uh, weakened or uh, I think what I think Putin made a serious mistake in his own terms, uh, because I think it's Russia and to some extent China that have been weakened by these events. Even though we're a very large economy, we obviously have our own problems internally. How can, do you think we are able to continue to project power? Because then the final question is, what will, ha- what will the world do with such a weakened Russia? I mean, that is a very big country. If, if I look at um, American power, um, we have many advantages that, um, uh, for example, um, geographically, we're bordered by oceans and friendly neighbors. China has, has 14 neighbors and territorial disputes with about five or six of them. Um, if you look at demography, uh, the American population is still growing. Uh, China's population is tapering off and their workforce stopped growing in 2015. If you look at um, technology and advances uh, in new technologies, uh, most surveys of the world's leading research universities, uh, including one done by China's Jiao Tong University, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, show that um, 15 of the top 20 universities, research universities are in the United States, none are in China. So the US has a lot of high cards to play. The, the real question is, will we play them well? And um, there the thing that worries me is our internal uh, polarization. I think it's less the economic inequality per se than the political polarization uh, that, uh, that worries me. Uh, and we'll have to, I mean, that to me would be the major worry about projection of American power. The, the American power resources, as I said, are there. Uh, whether we can play the hand that's been dealt as well uh, depends on our internal problems. Now, where does Russia fit in the end of all this? Um, that's going to be difficult because um, uh, you're going to presumably have a resentful, economically damaged Russia, which is, uh, uh, it's in our interest to try to reintegrate it into the world economy. And um, part of this will depend what happens to Putin and um, to what extent there's a willingness on Russia's part to be reintegrated. Uh, but our goal ought to be to, uh, after this uh, terrible situation in Ukraine is, comes to an end somehow, uh, is to find ways to uh, reintegrate Russia um, and hope for a better Russia in the future. Thank <music> you.